Hi, it's Lindsay Wilson and you are here for our fourth installment of How to Sell. I'm so happy to be here with you. Oh, let's start as we always start by closing our eyes <clears throat> and taking a nice big breath in of hope and safety and fun and joy and sales conversations. And if that made you totally tense, exhale it. <laughs> Hmm, we are going to change the way that you think about sales conversations today. Hmm. Just breathing in if you find any areas of tension, any areas of lack. Hmm. Just imagining all of the stress of your body and strain just sliding off down into the ground. And for a moment, really root into why you're here with me. What was your goal in doing this experience with me? What was your need? Where do you feel blocked? Where are you making progress? Just really acknowledging yourself for being here. Plenty of other things you could be doing at the moment. It's really brave to transform an area of your life. And with that last exhalation when you're ready, go ahead and open your eyes. So... We have a lot to talk about tonight, and I'm really excited because this is the area where people most often get uh, clenched up. They can understand all sorts of sales theory, all sorts of how to make a buy one, get five free <laughs> offer, or whatever the case may be, but in the throes of the moment of being in the sales conversation is where they choke. And so I cannot wait to present this information to you. So a few things to start with. We've already talked about, talked about how important bonding is, and bonding is going to be the basis for anything that you're doing in sales. So even before I give you the five points on how to make it through a sales conversation with flying colors, what I want you to do is remember that bonding is where it all begins. In the same dating analogy that I've used before, you wouldn't imagine you know, going home to meet someone's parents for the holidays if you've never made it on a first date. And so you need to take things in a numerical, logical order. And the first thing is bonding. Bonding, and this is foundational, is always about them. It's never about you. And you'll know in your body, you'll be able to sense when have you actually bonded with someone. And you also need to know that as a salesperson, a few things. When you are selling from your own product line, when you are selling from your own business, something that's really important is to take into account if this is the target market that you really desire to be with. Because it's like a little drop in a pond, a little pebble that skips across a lake. Um, you get to see all those little ringlets that go out from it. They will tell their friends about you. Their friends will tell their friends about you. I can't tell you, it's amazing to me when I get referrals from people very often when a referral comes through a third person, it's not even someone I know. I wouldn't say that that's the preponderance of situations, but I've been amazed lately as I ask more and more, where did you hear about me? It's from people who I didn't even know that they knew that I existed. So you really want to think about when you're in the bonding process with someone, if it is for your own company, if you're getting ready to do a huge, you know, $60,000 package with them for, you know, six months. Do you really want to spend all this time with this person? If you're selling for someone else, sometimes it's about bonding with someone, though they may not be your ideal, you know, and sometimes out of necessity. You also have to really figure out, like, what's negotiable. So perhaps I'm not, um, there's a wonderful book that talks about the different uh, personalities of buyers and there's one set that's the scientific buyer and that was always the most difficult person for me to sell to because my brain doesn't function in that way. Now I've learned that there are things I need to do in order to be able to work with that kind of person. There are, I'm not one for numbers, I'm not one for facts, I'm more for ideas and that sort of thing. However, if I am working with someone who is of a scientific 
um, personality type, then what I really want to do is have those numbers and facts on a piece of paper that's with me so I can make it through that. Otherwise, the bonding never happens. <clears throat> And if you've not bonded, it's like, do not pass go, do not collect $200. Because if that bonding is not in place, very often it's going to be very difficult to sell someone to someone, particularly in this economy where we have a lot of choices and people are more careful with their money. They're not going to go, oh, well, I'm not sure if she's the right person to really help me with my physical fitness, but I'll, what the heck, I'll do it. She doesn't seem like she'll harm me at all. It's really not what's going to happen. 50% of sales, I really feel, is relationship. It's really about that person being engaged with you. It's about that person trusting you. It's about that person unconsciously picking up on things about you that let them know how the experience is going to be. And even though it may not be pieces that they voice or pieces that they're even aware of, there's sort of this third dimension of things that are going on in my unconscious, going on in your unconscious, and moving people forward in the sales conversation. So bond, 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 bond. And if you're not sure if you're bonding or not, 10 times this week, go out and try to bond with someone. Try to bond with people you would never imagine bonding with. And there are a number of ways. I'll just give you a couple of quick tips so that you're able to know certain things. Compliments will get you very far. Genuine compliments are really key. So if you love someone's hair, if you love their shoes, if you love the sound of their voice, if you loved their Facebook picture, compliments often work really well. Asking people about themselves, we love to be heard, we love to be seen, we love to be valued. So if you will allow people to talk about themselves, and not typically about what's the matter at hand, because they're generally not going to want to talk about like why they're needing to purchase blah 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 at the onset. But if you can ask them how the weather is, um, responding to their needs. You ask someone how the weather is, they don't want to talk about it. Okay, they're in a hurry, and that's something that's um, something you're going to really need to take into your awareness, that you need to be um, really paying attention to their needs. Uh, when I worked in very, very high-end sales, the thing that I knew were most important to people were speed. If I was in the back room and I was finding stock for someone, I would jump over boxes because that care of them mattering and their time being important made a tremendous difference and undivided attention. It's like if someone were knocking on the window out the back door and I'm still talking to you but I'm sort of paying attention to them, you don't feel as cared for, you don't feel as seen, you don't feel as heard, you don't feel as valued. So it's complete attention. So speed and attention were absolutely key and these things also will play a huge role in, in any level of sales I would say. So. Here's an analogy that I want you to stick with while we go through this, which is maybe not the best analogy, but I think pretty good. I want you to contemplate if you were someone's coach, if you were someone's teacher, if you were someone's doctor, what would be the role that you would take in that situation? And so we're going to go a little clinical for a while, but I want you to really think if you were someone's doctor and they came into your room or you were on the phone with them, you have a certain role and you're going to stay within that role. And you might talk about the breeze, the birds, the whatever, you know, the sports, that sort of thing. However, you have a job to do. You have a role to maintain. It wouldn't make sense if in the middle of the consultation you started crying your eyes out about how your life, uh, your wife left you. You've got um, a specific assignment of duties to be done. There's no like positive or negative connotation to it. It just is reality. That's how I want you to think of sales. Because the place where most of us get choked up is when we switch into the salesperson role. We're good with bonding. We're good with talking about our product. We're good at asking them questions, finding out what their needs are. And then it comes time to talk about money. Or then it comes time to talk about the transaction. And that's where we go all numb inside and we sort of puff up and we become a little bit different and we put on a whatever and we're uncomfortable and it's awful and we feel bad and at the end of the situation we don't even know how they feel. So I really um, would prescribe to a new way of doing sales that's about you leaving the uh, interaction and being whole and your client or your customer leaving the interaction and being whole also. It's not about someone walking out with power and someone else not having it. It's not about someone getting what they want. 
someone else not having what they want. It's about both sets of needs absolutely positively being met. And what we're going to focus on here tonight are the places where you may be really shooting yourself in the foot. So if we think about you being a doctor, um, I used to say all the time, it's like you want to be in a tennis match with them, but you're not the person across the court. You're not their adversary. You want to be the person who's on their doubles team. And I would even up it a notch a little bit. I'll try this one on. You all are getting this first training. But the truth is you really want to be their coach. So you are their doubles teammate, but you also are their mentor. You also are the person who knows more. You also are the person who can help them. If they're not able to get a volley, you're able to make a suggestion so they can do that. And that's the role that you want to take in a sales situation. So we're going to keep that analogy going and see how it goes. Um, another piece for us to contemplate is very often you'll hear people who will teach people how to sell and the sale is all about them making sure that the person purchases no matter what and that's not what we really want here either because there are plenty of people that might purchase from you who are actually not the people that you would want to be working with and so I'm not suggesting that you are um, and people really, it's interesting because people get very upset when I start to use this terminology. And I think it's because it's loaded. And so I'm going right there. We're not here to force someone on someone, something, something. We're not here to force something on someone. We're not here to make people take something they don't want. In my life, my hope for my business is not that I force you to be a part of it. It's not all about the money. You are doing a transaction that will affect the longevity of your business or perhaps not doing a transaction. Some of the people that actually, I'll be honest, me as a buyer, um, I am not, uh, I think it's changing in some ways, but in some ways I can just be like the worst customer in the world. I am my own nightmare customer. <laughs> Um, I don't make decisions quickly. I want to know a lot of details. And so I'm not that like in the door, here's my credit card out the door. Um, pieces of that are changing, but some of it's just, that's not the way it goes. And so, um, when you might see me as a client, the, my typical way of being is it's like, I'll find a brilliant masseuse. And because of some block I've got about massage, I'll send everyone I know to that masseuse. I'll schedule appointments with that masseuse and cancel consistently. And I will send more business to that masseuse before I ever get there myself. Um, and it's quite astounding. So yes, you might during your time with me go, wow, Lindsay is really not the client that I want. Um, and that would be a decision that you can make. But the other piece is to know that the bonding that you're doing with me, although it might not equal a transaction immediately, I'll send loads and loads of business your way. And that's really the goal that you've got. So the goal is not who have I got on the phone and how can I make them do what I want and get money into my bank account. But the goal is for my business, what kind of client base am I trying to cultivate? How am I meeting my goal in big ways? And you'll start to look at things from a more um, not instant gratification of the moment, what's cooking. But overall, like you are the caretaker of your business's well-being and how can you best take care of that? And sometimes it's to not sell to certain people. So I just really want to be straight with that from the beginning, that this is not a class about how you force something down someone's throat. I'm not an advocate of that because very often what you'll find also is that people that you do that with want to return things. People will talk a lot about how do you get a sale to stick. And if you are that person's guide, if you are that person's doctor, if you are that person's mentor, if you are their tennis coach um, throughout the transaction, what you're going to find is that you don't run into those obstacles because you're in relationship the entire way, which is what we really want. So Having taken that role on, here are your five points in terms of how we move forward in a sales conversation. And some of your sales conversations will go a little bit different than this, and some of them will certainly not follow the script. And all of that's fine, and all of that's great, but I would find that all of these parts somehow happen. And so the first is this. You need to know a bit about the person you're selling to. Now, this can be applied to if it's on your website. What you're going to do is um, infer what the needs are of your target market. What are the psychographic 
um, challenges that they have, what pain are they in, what are they wanting, do you want the cutest little girl on the block? Like if you know that that's the hot button for your target market, then that's part of the script that you put on your web page. So I'm not just talking about phone interactions. This applies consistently throughout the board. So just creatively think of using these parts in all the variety of ways that you would have a sales conversation. So the first piece, like any doctor, you want to know what's going on with you, how can I help you, what's the problem, just like being a car mechanic, any of these other things. You bring your car in, they don't sit there and talk about the tires. I have 89 different kinds of tires, these are all great tires, until you're exhausted and then you go home. No, hi, why are you here today? What can I help you with? Same thing with a doctor. And so sometimes people will call this diagnosing a person's pain. If you're a coach, if you're selling a service, um, what you really want to do is diagnose their pain, for lack of better terminology, but you want to find out what's going on with them. Why are they talking to you? How can you help them? And this is an important important point. What I'm going to consistently do through our conversation tonight is point out points where people tend to have huge breakdowns. And so one of them will be, I find out how I can help you and I start to help you. That's not what this is. If you go to um, a shopping mall, and they're spraying perfume on you when you go through the line. So you can sample it. So if you, it would be very hard to buy a fragrance without knowing what it smells like. Wonderful way to get people to smell it. However, you would never be like, wow, I really like this. I'll take it and take the tester out of the person's hand and take it home. They would never give that to you. It's imbalanced. It doesn't make sense. It's not what we're here interacting for. In the same way, <laughs> this is where we really run into problems a lot of times. If you are doing some sort of service that can be conducted during a sales conversation, very often people start giving it up. Oh, there's your pain. Well, why don't you do this, 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 this. Don't do that. You don't need to slide into the, the doctor's getting paid. That's the other thing. So maybe the analogy doesn't work well there. There's always going to be a bill at the end and you're always going to be paying for it. But if the doctor weren't getting paid, what would the doctor do? The doctor would probably go, okay, so your ankle hurts. Um, I can fix that. You want to let them know that you can fix it. And then here's the price and you can pay the price and I'll fix it or not. So in the same way, you want to diagnose their pain and that's just the first step. Why are they here? What can you help them with? What are their needs? If it's product, um, similar things like is your skin dry? Um, do you want to look cute for the holidays? Like whatever those things are. But what you really want to do is find out from them if they need you. Because if they don't need you, it is not worth all of the time and the energy you will put into trying to get them to purchase something only to be disappointed. One of the main resources that you have when you're in sales is your own energy. And you don't want to be using it in places where it doesn't make sense. Sales is not like gambling. It's not random. It's not a statistic thing. It's not like rolling dice. It's not like I do a sales spiel and then hopefully at the end a certain number of people sign up. Absolutely not. No way. If I know from the get-go that there's not any way that I can provide a service or a help for you, we're done. And I get to say, wow, I love that you have ankle pain. I'm not a doctor, but I would suggest you see one. I think you should go do that probably really quickly. It's been a delight to be on the phone, and you know, I send warm wishes to you. Goodbye. We don't put me through the wholesale spiel you know, magically thinking that something's going to pop out the other end. That's not what transpires. That's not how sales happen. So at the very beginning, what you need to get clear on is what are they here for? What are they needing? What are they wanting? The next piece that you will do in the sales conversation, number two, is letting them know how you can meet that need. So this, I think, is where a lot of people run into trouble. And this is a huge part of listening and one of the wonderful benefits of being in business on your own. You may go, wow, it is phenomenal what this person wants, and it's totally not what I have to offer. And um, I think I said this recently, but I had a client one day who was like, can I just lie? And it was like, it's just so much easier not to lie. It just really is. And so you may find, um, I really don't have what they need. Um, or uh, it's just not meshing up. It's not sort of the perfect fit. The other thing I would encourage you to do at this point, though, is really listen to what they're saying. So they might say, 
yes, I do want to have the cutest girl in the world um, for her school pictures. And your hair bows are a little bit last year. Now, you may have five million of those hair bows and still need to sell them, and that's fine, and we can go find a different target market for you or sell five, you know, get a discount, or who knows? You know, there may be another set of little girls who love that. I used to travel from New York to Missouri for the holidays, and I would um, do layovers in Nashville. I'd fly northwest, and I would always say it's like I flew to Nashville, and I'd look at fashion, and it looked like it was about 10 years prior. Then I'd fly to Missouri, and it looked like it was about five years prior. So I don't say anything, you know, specifically about sending your hair bows to Nashville, but there are a lot of different options at that point. Um, what you want to be doing in the second part of the sales conversation is conveying what you have. So talking about what you have specifically that meets their needs. Something that's really crucial in the sales conversation is if you are talking the majority of the time, it is not going well. It's just the truth. You really want them to be speaking most often. And if when they're doing the first step and telling you what it is they need and they want, they're very brief, you want to think of other questions that you can use, not yes-no questions, but really to get to the heart of the matter. Because another part of your job during the sales conversation is to establish enough trust that they really let you into what they're thinking. All of us come into a sales situation at one point or another and feel like, oh, I'm not going to let them know what's going on with me. It doesn't actually even help the buyer. So in order for them to really decide if they want to move forward with you, they need to be open on and honest about what's going on. And if someone, you know, old school sales uh, knowledge says that if someone is not purchasing from you, it's because they have a hidden objection. If you have covered all of their objections, if they've said it's a little bit pricey and you say, well, I have a three pay option and they're like, oh, okay. The reason that they're not purchasing at the end is not because your three pay option wasn't clear enough to them. It's because either their oh okay was a lie or perhaps they've got some other thing that's going on in their mind that you don't know about. So in the sales process you really want to befriend them. And I will tell you that some of my biggest advocates are people who have not purchased from me. We've gone through the sales conversation, they've realized that it actually wasn't a fit for them and they will see me at events and recommend me to other people and think, wow, Lindsay was amazing because she really let me know that it wasn't gonna work for me. And so you really want to be congruent with what you're really offering and also really listening to what people are saying. So. Just back to the example, if they tell you that your hair bows are very last year, you really want to take that information and not disregard it because it may be giving you really powerful information for how you need to change your business. Now, if someone gave me an opportunity like that and said, well, it's not quite right, it's not exactly what I want, I would delve further because their input is going to be a lot more valuable to me, honestly, than people who even purchase what I have to offer because they're going to let me know the things that I'm not seeing about my business business and the opportunities that are there. And so going down that route with them, the other uh, possibility is that if you really understand what their needs are, you might be able to put together a custom package or a custom item or a custom product that really would work for them. So you really want to be involved. It's like you're getting in a boat with somebody and going down a river and the two of you are going to, you know, it's like a kayak, you're canoeing together or something and you need one another to make it through this. That's very much what a, what a sales transaction is. The credit card that gets handed at the end it's just a symptom of all the things that have come before it. So no one just pops a credit card out of nowhere. There's been something that's built the entire time and your job is to really get your finger on the pulse of how it's landing, what they're thinking, if they're wanting it, etc. So if you're a doctor and you have one of those little things and you're hitting on someone's knee and they're reacting or not reacting, or even better yet, I had dental work the other day, the dentist continually, are you okay? 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 <laughs> yes. Uh-huh. 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 And so you want to have that kind of interaction with people. 
So ask them questions. What do you think of it? How do you like it? Does this sound like it's a fit for you? Um, and, you know, I wouldn't go for questions like, can you afford it? You know, I think that that's probably not really where we want to go. But if you are the voice that's on the same side of the tennis court, if you are the voice that's the person who goes shoe shopping with someone, if you've developed a relationship as friend rather than adversary, they're going to tell you the truth. I wouldn't say to my doctor, oh, when you push on my abdomen, it, it doesn't hurt. If it really hurt, you'll be like, yes, it hurts. And so you want people to be letting you know what they think. Now, something that I would do, because some people really will hold their cards close to their, their cards close to their vest, as the saying goes, is I used to, <laughs> when I'd sell condos, I'd say to people when I couldn't figure out what they were thinking, I'd say, let me guess, you hate it. Not necessarily thinking that they hated it. I just had no idea what they were thinking. And so then they go, no, 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 we like it. We just wish there were another bathroom. Like they'll totally tell you what's going on. And so you need to figure out a way. And it's like, do not pass go. Do not collect $200. You're around the Monopoly board again until you can find out what they're thinking. You really need to know. And you can even just be, this is the piece that people very often don't get. I think it's a very masculine way and, and nothing against it, but, you know, I've seen a number of men in the years I've been in sales who are able to sell without a certain level of intimacy. But in this economy, that level of intimacy is important. And so to be able to say to them, what are you thinking? To be able to say to them, how does that sound? All of those things are the things that will actually enable you to close a sale. If you have no idea in the middle portion whether they're interested or not, something is wrong. Something is really wrong. And we're never going to be able to diagnose what's going wrong at that middle point unless you start to ask them what's happening. So it's not the same as, as an entrepreneur, you're getting a salary no matter if you sell or not. Then, you know, like who really cares what goes wrong in the middle of the thing? You'll miss a little commission, but you've still got your, you know, regular nut to take home. That's not what happens here. If you're not finding out what's going awry in the middle of all of your sales situations, you're never going to grow. It's never going to change. It's never going to be able to bring in more money. So let me just say one more time, it is crucial for you to be asking, what are you thinking? How are you feeling? Does that sound good? Um, do you like that lotion? Um, does that sound like that would work for you? Is there anything different that I could offer that would make it work for you? I mean, before those people walk away and say, no, no, don't want it. Find out what it is that would have made it work. You may discover that you've got a whole new area of opportunity for products and services that you had never thought of. People will tell you, people will tell you, if you don't come at them in a role where you are, I don't know if it's power or what it is, but if, if people feel like they are on the same level as you, they'll tell you the truth very often. Very often, very often. And I think you'll start to see that some of these qualities in purchasers are qualities that you're going to want. And so it's important to be able to have them in relationship with you, honest with you, telling you exactly what they feel. So. Excuse me. Well, gosh, so rude. <laughs> it's hit that time of day. Lack of coffee nothing to do with anything. So anyway, um, the next piece that you want to do, number three out of our five, is um, you want to um, offer some value. Don't give away the farm, but you really want to let them know the ways in which you can meet their need. So if they've said um, in the first step, yeah, I struggle with losing weight, and I don't know what to do about it. And in the second step, um, you've really contemplated, do you have what they need? Um, and then here are the ways that you can meet that need. Um, very often, what we do is we start to sort of go in reverse at this point. Okay, so it's been clear that both of us are going to be able to do whatever, but we start to get, what happens, I think, is we become self-conscious, and we start to get afraid and we start to go oh here comes the part about money and so even before you get to the money part what you really want is just an agreement that it would be helpful to move forward and so if you get people when you're asking them what do you think and they go it sounds good 
That's great. You just need to know that you're that far along before the money piece comes up. And so you really want to get a level of agreement. Um, and for instance, if you're doing coaching at this point, rather than switching into the role of, okay, and so now I'm going to like sell you the thing for $9.99.99, um, what you want to do is say, wow, so um, I'm understanding that this is the area where you're having pain. Um, here are the ways that we could do that. Feel free to sprinkle it with a few ideas for them. And it doesn't have to be fully developed. You might even say, um, have you stopped eating whole wheat? Um, uh, have you ever been metabolically typed? Things that bring up a little bit of an appetizer for what they're going to get when they purchase from you. Because what starts to happen is as we've left the first part of the conversation where they're talking about what their needs are and as you've started to talk about what you're offering, then if you start to move into and here's how much it is, you're not having that conversation flow back and forth. You're not having that give and take. So if instead you say, wow, here are some ideas and you pepper it with little things that they might contemplate or that they'll know they'll get from you, it engages them again. It allows them to feel what they're needing and wanting it again. It's a great way to check in with them and make sure that you're, you're delivering what's necessary. It's like if you were teaching a small child how to swim, you wouldn't get them in the pool and be like, okay, is the water okay? Okay, great. And then be like, plonk, swim. <laughs> Horrible way to do it. You get them in the water, you get them acclimated, and then you take them in the next place. Okay, so let's blow bubbles. So that's what you want to do here. You want to have that re-engagement of their interaction and knowing that things are comfortable to move forward and also adding a bit more value. Again, let this not be the place where you give it all away. And this is where an awful lot of us fall down. We start to overpromise. It's the same thing as being someone who's desperate for a date. Everyone feels like there's something wrong with that person. And so one of the things you really need to do, and I would practice even doing some sales with your friends, because it's like, you're not going to go out and, you know, do brain surgery for the first time never having watched a brain surgeon. If you can watch other people do sales even, that's freaking genius. If you've got someone who you know who's good at sales, go sit at their house for a day and listen to them make sales. Um, practice on people, the sales. Um, if you have kids, practice with them even. That will, you know, that'll be great because they'll be, the mo they'll be able to tell you totally when you're like, ew, gross, mom, or, you know practice with cousins, whatever you need to. But to only be selling when you're in the situation where it counts is almost just too much stress and pressure for anyone. So um, offer things that re-engage the part of them that want to move forward. I'm so excited for when we work together because we're totally going to be able to also overcome the part where you got afraid and couldn't sell anymore. I saw that and I just, I can't wait to move forward. Doesn't that make you go, oh, wow, okay, so I do, I still want to buy. Instead of like the glossed over, she's talking about what she's going to sell me. I'm sure it's going to cost me a lot of money. Let me think about how I can get out of this. Because it's just one of those natural things. It's like um, we don't put our hand into a flame. Uh, there aren't a lot of us who go, yeah, I want to buy stuff. So get them re-engaged. Um, the fourth part, I love this one. And it's so interesting because it's a piece that was really difficult for me in a piece that will totally transform the way that you do things. Don't stop selling. A lot of times people will say, okay, so yeah, I will take this sweater for my granddaughter. Great. How would you like to pay for it? I've seen some masterful salespeople who go, wonderful. Is there anything else that I can help you with today? which, you know, in a personal sales situation might not be the route that you would go in terms of the sentence that you would use. But that's lovely. Fabulous. So you'd love the sweater for um, them. Um, do you need sweaters for anyone else? Or someone signs up and they go, that's great. You know what? I will take your coaching package. That's a fabulous. Um, so... I want to tell you also about this other package that I have and get their agreement. You know, again, that this is always about, it's just like the etiquette that you would have if you met a friend for coffee or if you went on a first date. It's no different. And the moment you find yourself forcing anything, you're in old school sales and you want to get out of there. So what you can do instead is say, um, do you have another minute? 
and they'll say no if they don't <laughs> or they'll say yes and then go ahead and tell them about the larger package even and you can tell if you're good at knowing if you've bonded if the person is still engaged and if you start to feel them distancing even what you can do is say and so that's something that we have to look forward to in the future that's fabulous if you need to do that but people will tell you when they're done buying and very often we stop selling whenever they say they'll take the very first thing you'll hear a lot of people who will talk about you want to try to sell people on your biggest item first and if that doesn't work for them then you can go smaller and yes in theory that's one way to do it certainly but if someone has you know come in and they've been like I've heard about your coaching package for whatever um, you're not going to be like oh yes but I have one for five zillion dollars let me tell you about that people very often and this will happen consistently they will only purchase what you offer them if you don't offer them more they don't know they can buy it and they won't you will see them very soon purchase something much larger from someone else and it's like oh my gosh it's because I didn't put it out there so if you start selling you know 50% more than just whatever someone would originally take look at how that would change your monthly or your yearly income it's a huge, 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 huge way to make a tremendous impact in what you're receiving. So don't think small. And this, this, I mean, it's hard because at first uh, it's like, okay, you'll take it. Great. I'm done. But what you want to do is be even more expansive and go, well, um, might I also tell you about my VIP day? Or were there any other kids that you needed gifts for? Or... You know, think of a myriad of ways to do it, but what you're really providing is service. Um, I worked at jewelry once for a little while, and people would come in for the holidays for jewelry, and they'd be like, I can't decide between this and this. I'd be like, buy her this for Christmas and buy that for Valentine's. And so doubling the sale, but what a difference that made in terms of they got to go home and they had everything in their drawer and it was gift wrapped and they didn't have to think, and they actually looked pretty darn thoughtful because it all coordinated. So very often we get very small when we sell and we think very much based on whatever those fears are that come up in us so we go um, am I cool enough am I strong enough am I smart enough am I big enough am I worth enough am I lovable and that's the place that we sell from and what you have to start to sell from is a place of service so what does this person need how can I most help them and how can I be in relationship with them how can I be that mentor to them moving them forward and so I think what's hard for people very often is we get into a sales situation and we feel like oh we're just so happy to be liked but if you actually know the most about what someone is there for and I assume if you're selling something you're the expert at it it's like you wouldn't want to go to the doctor and have him say you should have your gallbladder out and then he fails to mention that your appendix should also come out like that would be malpractice and so in the same way in sales you really want to hear what they're needing and provide the greatest opportunity for that need to be met by them people who purchase large amounts from you will be like directly proportionally grateful for what they've purchased from having purchased that People really are there for your service, needing you, needing you to solve whatever their desire, ache, pain, whatever it may be. And so you really want to give them the opportunity to do that in Technicolor. And if you are thinking small, you're not allowing for that. So number four, do not stop selling. Now this is not to say you are pushing anything on them. Oh, buy this also, buy this also, buy this also. It's not the case not the case because it actually doesn't create the kind of transformation or recommendation or testimonial or customer base that you want I don't think you actually want a group of people who you've um, sort of smushed stuff in their face and made them buy it <laughs> but <clears throat> you don't want to allow your smallness of thought to dictate what they purchase um, and I promise you the minute I tell you this what will happen is you'll go out there and there will be someone who will purchase something very large that was completely unexpected by you um, sales has an awful lot to do with simply our mind expanding and understanding that there's more I mean the deal is this quite frankly 
like if we played musical sales positions and all of us ran around until the music stopped and someone else got in your chair and started selling your things, your sales would be entirely different. Because so much of what you're doing has to do with you and your own beliefs about yourself rather than your products, rather than your services, or rather than the reality of like even who your customers are. It really has to do with your own perceptions about you. It's like there's a transformational thing that I do with my private coaches that I now of course want to do with all of you and I cannot do with all of you, but just please know this, that if you are feeling triggered, if you're feeling like I'm not worth it, I'm not valuable, I'm not loved, I'm alone, any of those things when you're doing sales, um, that thinking is flawed. It's not the truth. And you want to come from a place of wholeness when you're selling. You want to come from a place of um, and service is very easy uh, to think of in terms of because you can override many of those feelings by being like, yes, and I am committed to the beauty of the earth. I am committed to the beauty of my clients. I'm committed to whatever it is you're selling and putting out in the universe. Um, but just start to notice if you get triggered on those little pieces that there's work there that has nothing to do with sales. Okay, so number five. Closing the sale. This is the piece that everyone always wants to know. How do you close a sale? Closing, closing, closing. And so um, here's the truth. If you have been in relationship with them, walking through this entire thing together. Hi, how are you? I love your shoes. Oh my gosh, I love your shoes too. That's so, You feel like my sister. You're awesome. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. That rocks. Let's talk about the coaching packages that I have available. Fabulous. So tell me why did you call me today? Oh my gosh, you're in pain about this. I can't believe that you're in pain about that. I so would love to help you. Let me tell you a little bit what, about what I can do to help you. So we could do this and this and this and this. And what do you think about that? Does that sound good? Oh my gosh. And you know what? We could even do, there's this really cool new thing that I do that will really solve this pain and I think it would be awesome and it would even make your cool shoes look better. Um, so tell me what you think. Oh, okay. Oh, so you want to know the price? Okay, so let's move, let, let me tell you. So here is how we move into pricing and moving forward. Um, do not abandon yourself at this moment. It just is what it is in terms of pricing. You would not go to the doctor and have the doctor go, Ip, and I'm not going to tell you how much I'm going to pay. Or how much, um, that's actually, that's not even Freudian. What if you were like, yes, I found out all these things about you and I'm not going to tell you what's wrong. Or I'm not going to fix it. That would be the appropriate analogy. <clears throat> yes, 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 we figured out you have all these broken bones and I won't be fixing any of them. It would not be appropriate. Here's another role to think of that might serve some of you. So if you are um, pet owners or if you are people owners, also known as parents, <laughs> or if you have a sister, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have anyone in life that you help, that you mentor, and that it's difficult with, this is the point in the conversation where you get to move that forward. Excuse me. So <clears throat> part of it is just having to buck up. Probably not fun being a doctor and coming out and saying to people, um, there's a 99% chance that your father won't make it, or whatever happens there. And those are roles, and those are things that we do. Um, we tell our cute little puppy, stop peeing on the carpet. <laughs> we um, <clears throat> tell our friends, um, I hate it when you drink that much. I love you. Please stop it. It's that same kind of role here. Um, but most of us, if we struggle with sales, bail at this point. We don't want to talk price. And so what happens is we start to do all uh, sorts of crazy, like, um, weird stuff that simply turns people off. We look at our shoes. We don't really want to talk about what the pricing is. <clears throat> we don't actually tell someone how much something was. Oh, this was a great conversation. Call me if you ever need me. The pricing point is simply reality and it's a place that must be walked through. When you went to go purchase a car, they didn't bail on the part where they talked about the price. It was something that you knew going in you would need to do if you were going to purchase a car. And if you bail on yourself or your clients when it comes to the pricing conversation, most often it has to do with a sense of lack of value for yourself. So this may be the part that you have to work on the most. Say it out loud. Just practice saying it. My so-and-so costs this much. Um, great, we can move forward for this much. 
<clears throat> there are wonderful other ways to say it. We could um, start with a an initial payment of $189. How does that sound? Get their agreement on that much of it. It's a wonderful way to move into the pricing conversation. But don't all of a sudden become like the tennis um, partner's player who runs off the court, jumps in their convertible, drives back past the tennis thing, and throws a smoke bomb out the window at their old partner and goes, $99! Like, don't become someone different. It's not Jekyll and Hyde, and this is what happens very often. So you really want to simply get used to breathing into your belly, saying your price. Seriously, practice it with five or ten people. We practiced kissing when we were kids. You can, you know, with watermelons or bathroom mirrors or whatever. Practice. You don't want the only time to be having this um, money conversation be the time when you are on the phone with clients. Do it until you are comfortable, until it rolls off your tongue. Practice it like you would practice a foreign language. Just get accustomed to it. I think very much what happens is because we don't sometimes engage in that many sales conversations, when it gets to this point, we just don't know what we're doing. And we just are sort of like jumping out of an airplane without a parachute, hoping that it goes well, which is crazy. So the money portion is simply the part where it is, I will trade you my um, sheath of wheat for your pig. It simply is value. It has no reflection whatsoever on your personal value. And so you want to take some of the charge out of it, <clears throat> and by practicing that will happen. And you also just want to state it very plainly. Um, you would never expect to go to a store and have them say, and here you can just take the TV home that you like, no problem. But this is what we do very often when we're in business for ourselves. We feel a personal stake in what we're selling, especially if it's our own personal services. And we flail when it comes to the, the part about money. What you want to get to the point of is where you can stay simply tuned into who you are, present in your body, able to say what the pricing is without shuddering. So even let me, for a moment here, I'm going to practice for a second so you can just see what it looks like because I think that this will be helpful. So say I were on the line with you and I were talking to you about one of my coaching um, packages. And so we've already dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. That the entire package sounds good to you, you're in agreement, and it sounds great. So either what's going to happen is you're going to say to me, so how do we move forward, which is a brilliant opening to talking about things. And we also know that if you say, so how much is it, that you're actually most likely interested in wanting to move forward. So that's a fabulous thing to have happen. And if you've done all the pieces prior to what we're talking about in this point, that should line up really nicely. If that doesn't happen, what you can do is simply say it very forthrightly, but you do want to do it after you can feel that the other person is wanting it. If you can't feel the desire from the other person, it's not time like the smoke bomb to just throw it out there and run away. Because the point of a sale is actually for the transaction to be completed. The point of the sale is not to just throw the price out there and survive. And I think that that's another error that very often we make. So when you can feel that they are actually desiring knowing more, they often will ask. If they don't ask, then you can say, so if you were interested in setting something up, I've got a couple of different ways that you can work with me. There is um, one package that is four sessions, and um, right now it runs $2,000. The prices are going to go up in the new year, but it's a pretty good deal right now. Or if you wanted to, there's another package that, and I'll, I'll be very frank with you, when I do sales and when I talk about the pricing on things, it's not the A number one thing in my mind. Like actually what my goal is during the conversation is to like have us commune together, to have us in agreement at the same vibration, liking one another and seeing what way we move forward. So it's almost when I'm talking about pricing with people, it's like if you've pulled up alongside my car and you've asked me directions to somewhere, there's just about that much emotional charge in it. Well, if you go right 
on this street and then you turn left at the next corner and then you go up the mountain I mean sometimes I won't honestly remember my prices all that well because it's not really all that much about pricing so um, sometimes I'm even like so you know what let's look at my web page because I'm not quite sure what the pricing is but the deal is what's happening is our relationship and our trust is really intact and we are grooving we are getting along we are of the same mind we are a team we are a partnership moving forward and that's what you need at this point in the conversation because if you do not have that it just your sales percentages are not going to be very good it is very much like throwing a smoke bomb and so when I get to this point of the conversation I'll say or there's um, another package where you can get I believe 10 sessions for 2000 and people very often at that point because we've really established trust we've really had a conversation that's gone back and forth I've really asked you what you thought. I've really listened to what you've said. And so at that point, people will very often say to me, well, I can't afford this and I'll do that. And their cards are completely on the table. And that's absolutely how you know that you're doing a great job at sales. If people are really being forthcoming with you after telling you what they need, after you telling what you can provide, after you all having this conversation that goes back and forth and you've decided to move forward, you know things are rocking if they go, I have to check with my husband because I spent too much last week on shoes and I'm not quite sure about moving forward. That's fabulous. So if you get to this part of the conversation and things don't pan out very often, here are a couple of other things that you can do. Um, you can always say, you know, if you want to move forward today, I'll give you a bonus of this. If you buy five hair barrettes, I'll give you a sixth one free. Very often, if you're if you've got a client like me, I'll be like, I haven't just because you've offered me a sixth one free. I know I can't say yes because I'm too impetuous, and so I've got to go sleep on it. That's fine. You say to them, no problem at all. I totally get it. No worries. We can still do you know the the five barrettes at the normal price. No worries. Um, and so you can entice people a little bit to move forward in that moment. And if it doesn't work, they can still, I mean, they've seen the value and what they want. They want to work with you. They get that they might not get, you know, the bonus, but that's fine. Um, I think very many people lose bonuses simply because they want to make sure they're making the right choice. And you have to respect that decision-making process. Um, very often you'll hear coaches say, I reward people who take fast action. I just, it's not me. It's not how I sell. It's not how I buy. And so um, if they don't want the bonus, that's great also. You really get to leave them whole. That's fine. I completely understand about having to check with your husband. No worries. Now here's the thing. Another place where people very often drop the ball is that they then do not follow up. They leave it up to the other person to get back to them. And that really is a huge disservice to yourself. Because it's like if a doctor was like, you have cancer, and then just let you go, and never called to follow up to see if you wanted treatment. And I don't actually know the protocol for doctors with that, but I can only imagine. Um, I have a wonderful doctor recently who, for an entirely different reason, called to follow up to make sure that I had found the information that I needed to move forward. Utterly brilliant. And in the same way, you want to call people if they are needing some time to decide. You can just leave a message just thinking of you just wanted to let you know that I was you know curious to hear what you had to say or what your husband wanted to mention maybe don't leave that on a home phone machine um, and don't just call once call again I'm huge don't follow up if you don't get them the second time maybe don't leave a message again just like dating you wouldn't call again and leave a second and a third and a fourth and fifth message but you might try three times to call leave a message don't leave a message then you get them live awesome we take it personally when people don't call us back and very often it doesn't mean anything it might mean it's a hard decision for them to make it might mean they're very busy um, it, it, it you're not doing them a service if they actually need you or if their life would be made better by having what you're selling them if you don't continue to give them that option it's bad customer service and so I've been blown away very often when I've called, and I'm sure you've heard me say this before, but it's like people would buy million dollar condos from me just because they were tired. They were so glad I called, they'd just take it. Seriously. That whole low hanging fruit thing. If someone's not calling and they haven't paid for something, 
it doesn't mean that things are black and white. It doesn't mean that they're so against ever purchasing from you. It doesn't mean they might not buy next month when your prices have increased because they made more money and they'll buy an even bigger package than what you had available now. So just because the relationship in that moment isn't them calling saying, yes, here's my credit card number, it doesn't mean that you don't want to continue that relationship and you don't want to see it through. People who have spent enough time talking to you and have really had a rapport with you and have wanted to move forward with you still will be thinking about purchasing from you next week, the week after. They may hire somebody else and the you know month after that they may be like, wow, I really wish that I'd hired Lindsay or whatever the case may be. So you don't want to end that relationship just out of self-consciousness. Send them a handwritten letter. Send them a note that says, thinking of you. You don't have to even set yourself up for a no. You know, you don't, I don't ever call anybody and go, did you want to buy it? Never. When you do that follow-up call, you're back to the land of bond again. So you call, hi, how are you? Good. How is your puppy? Awesome. And they'll come up right immediately with, you know what? I talked to my husband and he doesn't think it's a good time to buy now. Oh, really? Okay. Why did he think that? And don't push them, just be genuine. They'll tell you. And then after you've bonded a little bit more, let them go. Put them down in your book to call again in a couple of months or a couple of weeks, you know. Stay in touch with them. You'd be amazed when you are putting out sales energy into the world, sales will come in. Very often not from the source you think it will. You'll go through this entire process with someone. You'll have them talk to their husband. You'll be so hopeful that they'll purchase. Their husband will say no. You'll be brave enough to say, wow, I'm sorry to hear that. What did he say? And they'll tell you. And you'll get off the phone and the phone will ring instantaneously. It will be someone else buying. It is simply the truth and the energy about sales. So if you allow yourself to be small, to stay hidden, to not follow up, to not be engaged. In return, the universe will let you stay small. It will not engage with you. It will not move forward. It will not bring you sales. So you want to consistently be in this process and be in this process in a variety of stages with a number of people so that one person can say, today is not the day. And then someone else can call and go, yes, I did talk to my husband and he said yes. So you always want to keep the sales ball in the air. You always want to be in a variety of conversations with people at the beginning, at the middle, at the end. And can you call me back in a week? Sure, put them in your calendar, keep calling them. And then the last tip that I would say that is crucial and just so hugely important in terms of the sales conversation, because it's not just about this purchase. If this purchase goes well, they will tell all sorts of people, you will get a lot more referrals. Also, if this purchase goes horribly, same thing, you will, and you will lose a lot of business not knowing it based on this. You always want to thank people for their purchase. So that can be a follow-up note, that can be a follow-up phone call, that can be a follow-up gift, whatever you would like it to be. Even if you are not having a lot of people to call about sales and people said no, you can call them a week later and just say, you know, I really wanted to thank you for your time. And I know that now is not the right time to work together, but I just really loved meeting and talking to you. And you could even say, you know, if you ever think of anyone who could use my services, please let them know. Those are wonderful ways to generate sales also. But you want the relationship to be ongoing. It's not like you only cared about their feelings when they were potentially going to give you money and then you forget. Because very often what will happen is the impressions that, that is made at the end of a sale, the note that someone is left with afterwards, like the note of a perfume, the thing that you can smell long after they've left um, the room, that very often is a huge predictor of your future sales. And so you always want to remember, even like if you don't have anybody to sell to today, get in touch with all the people who purchased from you a year ago. Just wanted to call and say thanks. I really appreciated your business. That's what we're all really looking for. Bottom line, people are looking for love. They're not actually looking for coats. They're not actually looking for um, coaching programs. They're not actually looking for cars. I mean, they are in part. But underneath all of that, the driving force is connection. And when you take some time out of your day 
to connect with people in a way that is unexpected, that is really meaningful. I mean, don't call someone who has no time at all to say, I just wanted to spend the next half hour telling you how great it was working with you. That's not going to work. Drop them an email. Be concise. Respect people's needs. Respect what they've put out there to you. But by thanking people, it will tremendously drive up your sales. It will drive up the well-being of your business, the well-being of your clients. It will totally, it's a game changer. It's different than how most people do things. Um, and I think that's about it. I think that um, those are this, I can't believe it's been a freaking hour. But that's a really thorough start to how to have a sales conversation. And I would say listen to this recording over and over. You're going to probably find new little bits and pieces as you go through. Um, just if, if nothing else, the thing to remember is this. You really want to be engaged like a friend with someone throughout this entire process. At any point when it goes awry and it's like this is not a match, be done. Don't be hopeful and think it will work, especially if you know that it won't. There are a million other people out there in the universe who want you who need you who will buy from you but do stay like you would with any other good friendship don't just give up immediately don't run away don't be afraid just really really be you really be you and know that receiving is part of this and practice the hand exercise if all else fails walk around just every day at least five times a day open your hands see how comfortable it is figure out how much you really are able to receive um, sales is all about being able to receive. Practice saying your sales spiel to, you know, stuffed animals if you need to. <laughs> um, but sales is really not all that scary. People need you, um, and, and this is just that door that you get through in order to make that move forward. So I'd be so curious to hear about where you get stumped in the sales conversation. Feel free to go to my Facebook page, which is facebook.com, and you can go to slash I like Lindsay, my recently renamed page. So that's facebook.com slash I like Lindsay, or Twitter, it's at Lindsay Wilson. And let me know specifically where you get stumped in here, because I would love to even help more. And uh, it's been great being with you tonight. I've really enjoyed this, and I hope you have too. Thanks. <laughs>